You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to Apple Insider Podcast 168. I'm Victor, and joining me is Mike Worthley. Hello. Hello. Mike, let's let's cover some quick news that we can get out of the way really fast up front. Sounds like a good plan. Things that our listeners, our users, right, should be concerned about, or at least be aware of, let's say, are Apple ending support for some applications. Now, normally Apple is very good about continuing support for things for a very long time. Would you agree? In general, yeah. The uh, yeah, but let's continue. There's there's nuances that need to be put on this conversation okay. as we as we go. Right. So. so so first of all, when I say ending support for some applications, what that means is that uh, Apple's had a years long push on the Macintosh to get the operating system and all of the applications moved over to what's called 64 bit applications. Mm -hmm. And and this is something that we saw a year ago or so with the iPhone, where the iPhone 5 was a 32-bit processor, 32-bit applications, and that the push was to move everything over to 64-bit capable phones. Now we're seeing that same kind of process take place on Mac. Yeah, frankly, I'm surprised it didn't happen a lot sooner. The first 64-bit code was possible in 2008. So this has been a 10-year process. Do you know what the first 64-bit capable application was or 64-bit compiled application was? I actually do not. I do. Chess.app. Follows. I could, I could <laughs> believe that. So I was having a Twitter conversation with Gary Witta, who is the screenwriter for Star Wars Rogue One. And uh, he, he, you know, he, he was talking about chess, and he said he'd like to interview the people responsible for maintaining chess.app, because how, how much does it really see as an update? And it was so interesting, because I went back and I looked through all of my screenshots and, and booted up some old Macs, and there it was. Chess has gone through actually a lot of change, both visually and 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 across the years, from you know Next Step to Open Step to Mac OS 10.0 through about 10.3, and then it changed again with Tiger. And, and it's changed backgrounds over time. It's changed skins for the, the chess pieces. It, it's gone through quite a lot of change, including being the first application that I could find that was compatible for 64-bit. I know. This sounds like a pretty good gig if you if you get a coding gig at Apple. Seems like a low-stress job. Could have a lot of fun with that. I, I think it must be a rather <laughs> high-stress job. You know, it can't, <laughs> Being the one guy working on chess doesn't mean that chess is your only thing, right? <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. You know, you've also got to be working on DVDplayer.app. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> which uh, which also well, is sixty four bit compatible, yeah. right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Is it mine? When I checked earlier in the year, it was still only thirty two bit. Is it sixty four? I bit thought now? that it was, and you know, it kind of makes sense that if 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 you imagine for a second that there is an alien spaceship coming to invade Earth, and you need to upload a virus to this machine to to the alien spaceship, huh. you have to hmm. pull out your Apple SuperDrive and connect it via a USB to USB-C dongle to your MacBook Pro to to open DVD player to upload this, right? You see, you have such a you have such a a straight delivery on this that it's uh, you kind of have to think about that this is actually a joke what you're saying right now. That's the point of being a straight delivery on this. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm referring to the. Independence Day movie, the original one, not the second one. Oh, I, yeah, I know. What you're and, and of course, we don't have power books anymore. So now you got to go out and find an antique power book, which fortunately for us all, I have. So when when the alien apocalypse comes, I have your power book. All of that is to say that, that Mac OS is going to start alerting people that 32-bit app support is coming to a close. And this just in DVD player on the, the beta on... On the 10.13.5 beta is still 32 bit. Ah, oh, frustrating. Yep. You really will need me to have that PowerBook, won't you? I think so. The The point is that it's going to transition macOS to 64 bit, just as they did with iOS 11. Uh, High Sierra will be the last macOS version that will be able to run 32 bit apps without compromise. Now, it's not exactly clear what without compromise means in this context. Uh, it's entirely possible that there will be some emulation support or that some you know there 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 may be some compatibility possibilities there but start thinking about the applications you need and whether or not they're new versions and whether or not they're going to be supported if you upgrade your Mac and Mac OS. I, I dig old hardware, I dig old software. 
I like having new stuff too. Uh, you know, this all said, I, most of my stuff is on at least Sierra, but if you have a mission critical application that you're stuck on 32 bit, either talk to your vendor and see what the story is about 64 bit or consider not upgrading that machine, which is, is a very reasonable option as well. But if you're not going to upgrade your machine, may I highly recommend that you put a backup regime in, in, in place if you haven't already. Yeah, I feel like we could do a whole show on this kind of thing, having backup hardware and having backup software and offsite backups and, and that kind of thing. So maybe we should do that someday. That's a great idea. We'll have a backup episode. That's an excellent idea. I actually got some advice from um, Michael Johnson, who is, is also known as Dr. Wave. He is responsible for a lot of the infrastructure at Pixar. And he and I emailed a couple of years ago, and he gave me his whole backup regime. So we ought to devote a show to that where I tell you the secrets of Dr. Michael Johnson's backup regime. Yeah, why not? That would be great. Now, it's not just Mac OS that we need to talk about in this context. We also ought to talk about Watch OS. Mm -hmm. The latest Watch OS beta warns people when opening Watch OS 1 apps that the app needs to be updated, that support will end soon, that this app will not work with future versions of watchOS, and that the developer needs to update the app to improve its compatibility. Now, watchOS 1 apps, using the, the watchOS 1.0 SDK, were applications that lived on the iPhone, and when you opened them on the watch, they were essentially using the watch as a secondary display, much the way that when you airplay to a TV using Apple TV, you're using the TV as a secondary display. Or when you connect to a car play system in a car, the car dashboard is the secondary display. The application's running on that display. You're interacting with it through touch, but the hard and heavy lifting is being done by the phone. And those kinds of applications are, are being deprecated. I, I, the writing was on the wall in this one pretty clearly. It, there's been some debate over the, whether this means that the first generation uh, Apple Watch hardware will be sunsetted or not. I suspect it will be. I'm not talking Series 1. I'm talking what series kind of zero, retroactively right? call the Series 0, right? I, I have a suspicion it will. The original iPad kind of departed early, too, if you remember. And it's because it had a single-core processor rather than a dual-core processor. And there was a similar similar evolution between the original Apple Watch and the Series 1. We'll have to see. I mean, I'm not saying that the Apple One, the Apple Watch Series 0 is going to magically light on fire when watchOS 5 comes out or anything like that. Yeah, normally the, op the, uh, the display pops off and the battery expands. <laughs> I see what you did there. I, I'm not saying that the display is going to pop off and the battery is going to expand with watchOS 5. But it, it is something to consider that if you need the latest and greatest operating systems, again, this, this may actually be a more limiting case that will not necessarily be supported going forward on newer versions of iOS. So this is kind of a tough one. We're going to have to, we're going to have to wait and see what the ramifications of this actually are. It's, too early to panic, but it's early enough to start thinking about it. Well, and, and the thing is, is, as the watch has progressed and developed, the uses of the watch have changed a little bit. You know, and instead, oh, sure. of, instead of having to have Amazon and eBay and shop for things directly from your watch, we found that, that there was a lot better application for it in terms of notifications and mm -hmm. maybe having the boarding pass that you needed to have available when you were going through the airport kind of thing that there's, there's, it's about the right information at the right time at a glance without a whole lot of interacting. And many of those watch OS 1.0 applications relied on more interaction than we found to be really necessary. Yeah. There was a little bit of a disturbance about developers no longer supporting the Apple watch in general and not doing Apple watch apps anymore. But I think that's got more to do with use cases than anything else. I, I'm, I'm not saying good riddance to those people or anything like that, but it's if if it's not a good fit, let's try not to jam it on there, you know. Well, and that's happened just this week, even. You know, Instagram, as an application, started. Uh, they made an update, and in this update, they removed support for the Apple Watch. And I don't have a problem with that. It, the The Instagram application on the Apple Watch was chunky. It it wasn't a good experience for browsing through Instagram at all. And what exactly? Well, I guess my question is why? Well, why do you need an Instagram app for your Apple Watch? What it did and what it did best was that it gave you notifications about likes on your photos and your photo stream, or it uh, it gave you information about new followers and things like that, which if you're using Instagram as a social network, and you know some people are, there are, there are people with large amounts of followings who actually 
earn their living by being on Instagram and posting to Instagram. Sure. So having those kinds of notifications for that sort of person may have been useful. Um, in, in this case, Instagram decided that they were done supporting the Apple Watch for this kind of use, and they pulled it. I, I, I think it can be argued that if you're that kind of person that's making a living on Instagram, you probably need a bigger screen than the Apple Watch to do your interfacing with your fans. Well, as I say, it's it's receiving notifications and right. not necessarily responding to right. them. The, I, I agree that's probably where the phone comes into play. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you're taking selfies of yourself holding the phone so that everyone can see that you're using the phone. <laughs> yeah, the ever-present large mirror. That's important. Absolutely. Can you show, Does it show that I'm not really an Instagram user here? I, I would never have guessed. I mean, I, I have to recommend to all of our listeners, if you want to follow Mike Worthley on Instagram for his latest in makeup tips, I strongly suggest you go there. Uh, he does one brand a day using, you know, the best of L'Oreal and some of the others and, and, and strongly recommended his tutorials. Yes. Uh, no, but thanks anyway. No, no. Just, but, it's just, but that blemish mask has done wonders. Uh, I, you know, I know my limitations and Instagram is it. I mean, that's, you know, there's just, there's lines that I have that I'm like, well, yep. Will this serve me at all? Nope. Then I'm just not, just not looking at it. So well, follow that's the line right there. For everyone else, follow Apple Insider underscore official on Instagram. And, and maybe why not take a look at my account at V-M-A-R-K-S-I as well. There you go. So how that's about that? Too. Yeah, we do, we do typically try and put up more pictures of our review items there than we put in the review on AppleInsider.com. So that is use that is a good use for it, but again, just not for me. All right, I want to bring some information from one of our sponsors, and then we'll get to the meat of the episode. Speaking of meat of the episode, Butcher Box delivers a healthy, one hundred percent grass fed and grass finished beef, free range organic chicken, and heritage breed pork directly to your door. Just choose from curated boxes, including a mix of high-quality meats, or customize your own box. And whatever you choose, butcher box meats come from humanely raised animals that are never fed antibiotics, hormones, or fatty fillers. All meat is frozen at the peak of freshness in an individual vacuum-packed biodegradable packaging, and shipped with a carefully calculated amount of dry ice to ensure that it remains frozen after it reaches your doorstep. Delivery is completely free, and you can choose your delivery frequency. Think of butcher box as your neighborhood butcher. You'll even get recipe cards and tips to creating quality meals in every box. Now, I, I have some personal experience with this. I received Butcher Box uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's it's been fantastic. So first of all, the website is very clear. The website has recipes. The website is really clear about the sourcing of the meat and the quality of it. When they talk about 100% grass-fed, it's it's goes into some depth about what you can and can't expect from from these sorts of things and what that means. And I really liked it. Now, I've, I've gone to different grocers and grocery stores and tried to talk to the butchers there about it. And I've found that only a few different ones around me have the same ability to tell me, you know, what kind of farm it came from and, and what I can expect from the cut and things like that. So being able to get the, the cards with recipe information, being able to get the right cut of meat and having it come – in this this really well packaged thing, I mean, there's a cardboard box outer that it ships in that's lined with uh, biodegradable insulation that then is inside a sealed insulated bag that also has the dry eye. It really well, really well prepared, and the the quality of the food itself, the meat itself, was just superb. I mean, to put it like this, my my wife likes chicken; she does not like beef, and I convinced her to use some of the beef and do stuffed artichoke. And she, who never wants to eat beef and never enjoys beef, really loved it. She she said, we have to actually order again because it was so good. And she doesn't even like the stuff to begin with. So it really it knocked her socks off. For free bacon and $20 off of your first box, go to butcherbox.com slash Apple Insider and enter Apple Insider at the checkout. That's butcherbox.com slash Apple Insider and enter Apple Insider for free bacon and $20 off your first box. And now the meat of the episode. So <laughs> I, I, I see what you did there. <laughs> it, it, it wasn't planned. It just worked out. One of the stories that Mikey wrote about last week is the uh, – Actually, yesterday, now that I think of it, not last week, yesterday. It's an up-to-the-minute story. The news that suggests that Apple is cutting HomePod orders on weak demand. Yeah, this is – and to be clear, this is Mikey Campbell. I can't be at this keyboard 18 hours a day. This one this one came down the feeds, I want to say, about 8.30 uh, yesterday night, and Mikey Campbell took care of this for us. 
And the report cited a, a, a couple of different metrics that Bloomberg had collected and was talking about how Apple had cut the HomePod orders just based on weak demand, saying that orders aren't going as planned. Um, Apple's cut HomePod orders from the manufacturer in Ventec in March, less than two months after release. Uh, can this I, is a tough can one. I say something here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So whenever we have a report like this, it's important to break it out into different pieces because when we break it out into different pieces, we can talk about what may or may not be factual and what may or may not be opinion or conclusions that could be drawn from the raw information. So first of all, what is the raw information? The raw information is that there's the suggestion that orders have been cut. Now, there's there's no real numbers for that, right? There's no... Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot of layers to this. Th so, go ahead, so, go ahead. so then there's the speculation on top of that that says that orders are being cut due to low demand. And, you know, it, it reads as one sentence, but it's important to separate the two apart because there are other reasons that you can cut orders. For example, if you're doing demand planning and you're going ahead months ahead of time when you've got the device ramping up to production, but before you actually have done your pilot run, for example, you are pre-ordering all of the parts that have to go onto it and reserving your parts supply. You're going ahead and figuring out how many lines of production you're going to need to open up in order to make what you think is your, your possible demand. So it's much easier to go ahead and reserve all of the parts and reserve the manufacturing lines and the space in the warehouse and the employees that you're going to need to open up those manufacturing lines to meet that possible demand and have that all in place and then scale it back as opposed to not having done that, not having reserved enough parts, not having reserved enough production capacity, not having reserved enough employees to staff that production capacity, and then being stuck with demand and no supply. Yeah, it's way easier to go down than up. It, it way is. Way easier. And it's still a cost, but the cost is you have a bunch of the parts that you reserved on hand, or maybe you have them not even on hand, you've just reserved them so that contractually they would be supplied to you in time if you did need them, and you can release mm -hmm. them back. Mm -hmm. So your your costs are far less than they are uh, if, if you suffer the, the problem of not being able to supply units that people would like to buy. Did I, did I explain that well? Oh yeah. I mean, there, there, like I said, there's a lot of factors also involved in what Apple hopes they'll sell and what they're probably going to sell versus at where, what actually sells falls in. And no matter what you want to think, Apple does their best guess at this and it's not always right. Well, and they also don't really tell us exactly right. it, what they expect. Right. They don't come out and say, we set a goal of selling this number of units and that's right. exactly... No, they don't end up tell it. They roll it into some other factor of number on a financial report so that you kind of have to guess at what they sold. Yep. And, and the way these rumors go is they come from somewhere in the supply chain. The The Bloomberg report came from Assembler and Ventec. The uh, Another report came out today that I think is a little iffy just based on how, so, how parts order supplies are sourced, saying that Apple has cut orders from the parts suppliers as well. But again, the numbers that they're talking about in production are ridiculous. Still like 200,000 a month. That's a ton of these things. Right. So they put reser they reserved the capacity and they reserved the parts to support bigger sales and are now releasing that capacity back to the wild so that, that other people who need those parts can use them. Or mm -hmm. they they are simply not continuing to order that much, which is called adjusting your expectations and adjusting what you need which you'd want to do, right? Just in time inventory is about having the right amount on hand. So, I, I mean, there's, I mean, there's going to be a lot said about this in the next, in the next week or two, and, and then it will be replaced by the next scandal du jour or whatever that is. So, but can, can we address the speculation side of it, which is that the, the weak demand side of this? Yeah, there's, there's nothing to go on here. Well, wh why did that line seem to catch with people at Bloomberg and other people who are, are talking about the story? Why Why do people believe readily that there could be weak demand? Because in the time that we've been talking about this, in the last three minutes and 30 seconds we've been talking about this, you could have already read the Bloomberg story and not gotten any context based on what they said about it. So while we're talking about how things work in the supply chain, they're talking about, well, orders are down and, and things are terrible and, and Apple screwed this up and Apple messed that up. But none of that is... While that is readable quickly, it lacks context. And something like orders are down from what? 
Right. There's there's no I mean, number to know what they're down from. There, now, there's no relativity. There's nothing really to, to hang your hat on on this. And, and similarly, I saw a story that said something like an Apple retail store sells maybe 10 HomePods a day, which seems like not very many compared to how many phones go flying out the door or Apple Watches go flying out the door. And – Again, we don't know if that's true across all retail stores or just one, or if it's really true for that one, and it's just what some Mac specialist reported to a guy who asked, so, right? Yeah. What we do know is that HomePod is still in its early days as a product in terms of what its functions are and what it's able of doing. We know that Siri needs a lot of work in order to meet people's expectations for what it needs to do as a product. Would you disagree with that statement? No, I'm I'm just listening and <laughs> looking up something really quick. Fair enough. Um, just, just making sure I'm not alone here and that we know that Apple is working on hiring people for Siri and that Apple's working on hiring people to solve these problems, but that it, it's entirely possible that HomePod may have weak demand, but we have nothing to go on to really quantify that. I, my perspective here is that this product is going to be called a hobby. And that's fine. The, the, remember the, the Apple TV for years was called a hobby. And even when it began selling really great numbers, it was still called a hobby. So there are 272 Apple stores in the United States. Let's just count United States right now. Actually, you know what? Let's round this up to 350, including the whole three countries well, that the HomePod is. I was about to right ask. Now. So, which is another factor that hasn't been considered in any of this. So if you, if you assume there's 350 Apple stores, not including Best Buy or any place else that sells them, if there's 10 sold per day, that means there's 3,500 of these sold per day. Okay. Multiply that by retail price. So say 400 bucks just for the sake, just for the sake of math here. So let's, you know, I, you know what, let's just do it the right way. Let's just do 350 times 350 and we'll go from there. You know, that's $122,000 a day in HomePod sales. Okay, Wait, times 30 no, for the month. Times, I actually, we might need to edit this out. There's 350 stores times 10 per day. Yeah. That's just, let's see. So now we're up to 1.2 million per day times 300, say 358 days a year because there are a couple days. If you were in any business selling 1.2 mil gross a day, not talking net, just, just what the retail sales out the door are. You'd be doing pretty well, wouldn't you? Yeah, this is if you assume 350 Apple stores at 350 bucks a shot, 10 of them a day over 350 days, that is 428 million dollars a year. Right. So this is the thing about Apple scale is that you can have a product that is a weak product, let's say, that is not a fully baked product and still do ridiculous amounts of money. And the ridiculous amounts of money is is one of the things that can insulate you from understanding that the product is weak. But I, I think if they're looking at unit sales as opposed to the amount of money that it brings in, that they see that it's a weak product at this at launch and that they have work to do to really deliver on the promise of it. Well, you know what? Something else that's only going to sell about 10 units a day is, is the Mac Pro. Okay, but we agree that there's a whole scale of difference between the Mac business versus the iOS business. Sure, sure. And that... The HomePod fits as a category more within the iOS business and approachable to everyone who's an iOS customer as opposed to the Mac business where the Mac Pro should be a small subset of that very small Mac Pie. Well, I'm not certain that the HomePod was ever not intended to be a small segment of the iOS business. It it, it is it works the best with an Apple Music subscription or an iTunes Music Match subscription. Sure, you can use it as a standalone AirPlay speaker, but that's not really taking full advantage of the device. So I'm I'm not from the get go. I don't think that Apple ever intended this to be. Uh, we're going to sell a thousand a day out of each Apple Store product. Right, but if they're doing 10 a day, you, you'd want to see them double that to 20 a day or to get up to 50 a day or something. Well, it's also not exactly gift-giving gift giving season. Apple missed the Christmas season with the HomePod entirely. Yeah, and I, I think Siri really, as much as they position it as an Apple Hi-Fi 2 and as much as they talk about music being the point of the thing – I, I really do think that they know as well as the rest of us that Siri has to be a better part of it. I, I think that they also need to do Siri kit for music so that you can have music intents from the phone. There, there's there's a lot of wrinkles to be worked out, especially where you end up with the HomePod claiming Siri as a, a voice prompt for things that it can't do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, Siri needs to be a, a bit better in the HomePod. And 
our own review says that, and I have one in the house now, and I'm absolutely certain that it needs to be better at that. So, I mean, there's a lot to talk about with the HomePod. The story is still very, very early, considering we're only looking at since February on this. So we're two months in. I think it's way too premature to call this a failure. I think it's way too premature to call it a blockbuster success. But again, we're looking at a four hundred million dollar a year annual business. I, you know, it's I, I find and Apple, even if it's not a success, they're going to sit on it for a while until it is. Right, and I, my hope is, as I said, that they look at the unit sales. And that that drives them to do better as opposed to looking at the sales numbers and that allows them to be complacent. Mm-hmm. That would be good. My what, what gives me hope is that I don't think they're being complacent. And I say that because of the hire that they made. And you wrote this one up uh, last Friday mm-hmm. about the hire that they made over from Lab 20, 126 from the Amazon group. Yeah, they made a couple big hires last week, and we talked about one of them uh, earlier. Uh, you, you, I, last week, you guys talked about John Gianandria. Yep. And and this time I'm talking about John McCormick. John McCormick, yeah. Th- this is this guy's an interesting character. He he's going to be in so- he's vice president of software, and that's all that all that's all it says. It, it doesn't say that he's in Siri, it doesn't say that he's doing anything else. He worked with David Foster for a while, who was in the company who was in Apple forever up through the X serve, and he was a big factor in the iPad the iPod hard drive. My biggest concern about McCormick is if you look at his LinkedIn profile and his resume, he doesn't stay any place for very long. He, his longest stint was with, was with Google and he, and he stayed there for two years. He stayed with lab 126 for 1.8 years. So he, he, he bounces around a lot and I would like to think that he's found his forever home, but given the frequency that we do these poaching stories, I'm fairly convinced that he has not. We'll, we'll see how it goes. See, I, I would like, based on his history, I would like him to be in the quality assurance department. I'm a little uncomfortable with the word poaching. Okay. Especially when we're talking about John McCormick, because I don't feel like John McCormick is allowing himself to be poached. I think John McCormick is looking for interesting projects that sure. capture his attention, that allow him to move to something cool. I, I, I don't think he's waiting for things to come to him and then being wooed away as much as he is seeking out what can he change next? You know, call it what you will, but I, I, I would, I'm crossing my fingers that it's not going to be an 18 month stint. I'm, I'm crossing my, the guy's good. The guy's good at what he does. And I would like him to stay longer. Well, the question is for the 18 months, what is the lasting impact of his work, right? If he comes in for 18 months and shakes things up and delivers two product cycles worth of things that set something on the right course, is that enough? Well, it depends how quickly any kind of momentum on the previous course would would be ch- would take to change. It, it, it depends how much force he can apply to get that momentum change. It, there's there's a bunch of different factors here, and Apple is huge. Uh, there's there's no two ways to say it anymore. Apple is giant. It's got a giant manpower. It's got an entrenched corporate culture that may or may not be need to be changed depending on your opinion. Um, so when you insert one or two guys, in, including the previous hire what what's the catalyzing factor what what exactly changes the vector development or changes the corporate culture enough to get what we need out of the company hmm. so is 18 months enough i don't know i, I mean ask me again in 20 months i right. suppose and and i say two product cycles because the for for smaller projects for less complicated projects a product cycle is about 9 months mm-hmm. for and it's harder to get anything made faster than that, really, in terms of, of design tooling and the revisions you have to go through. It's just very difficult to get something spun around a whole lot faster than that. But yeah, I agree. for a complicated product like an iPhone, for example, that's that's a multi-year project. That's two years or more. It is. Um, yeah. So it's it's a valid question is – what can he turn around? Is that one product, one product cycle? What can he do within that time? But I I think the beauty of him being VP of software is that software is is one of those things that hardware guys always look at and say, well, it's just software; it can be done faster. And the truth is that speed is is not always the case when it comes to software. For example, when I when I was teaching school, the school that I taught at had a guy who was there before me whose name was Fred Brooks Jr. and Fred Brooks Sr. was a guy who wrote The Mythical Man Month. And The Mythical Man Month is is a book that was written at IBM years and years ago. But basically, the the fast summary is that you don't make 
a project faster by putting more people on it. That is, you it, it, one woman can give birth in nine months. You you don't put nine women on the job and get a baby in one month. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and so when you add more people to a project, especially if there are they're big players like this that want to steer the ship, does that slow things down, in fact? It, it can. I mean, I've institu- institutions are wacky. It, it's You're right. It's the law of diminishing returns. The more people you stack on a project, the less you get on the average out of each individual guy. Like I said, this, this is something that we're only going to see in retrospect. This is not something that we're going to see in six months. We're going to say, oh, hey, this is loads better. And it's because this guy got brought on. It, there's just no realistic way to see that. At least not a forehand. Right. Well, yeah. Now, I want to talk a little bit about Mark Zuckerberg. We talked about Facebook a couple of episodes ago. And Mark was testifying before Congress this past couple of days. Mm-hmm. And it's it's interesting to me because one photographer photographed the notes that he'd left open on the desk. Did you see this? I did. I did. And the the binder there laid open the notes and the bullet points, and they were able to be enlarged so you could read them. And there was a whole section entitled Tim Cook on Biz Model. Now, no one asked Mark to speak about Tim Cook. No one asked him to address the business model like that. And so he didn't have to bring up those bullet points or respond to it. But this seems to me to all go back to the... Kara Swisher interview that that she conducted with MSNBC's Chris Hayes. And, you know, that this was where Tim Cook had said that he wouldn't find him in this position. They've only used humanity to their products and that privacy to Apple is human right. And, you know, Zuckerberg's points laid out how he instead feels about Bezos and about how they feel they're breaking their product free by their by using their business model in the way that they do. And it's important to point out that a lot of the congressmen were reading questions that were fed to them by lobbyists and things like this, but that for Zuckerberg <laughs> yeah, to include too, a, so. a section all about Tim Cook and their business model, it really deeply affected him, right? This is something that got to him that really, really stuck with him for him to figure out that he would have to be prepared to address it like this. I'm not sure that he was the one who decided it needed to be addressed. Well, I mean, it the needed, it him. needed <laughs> right. It needed an answer if he was, I mean, it, but as the hearings wore on and on and on, it became so apparent that he could so easily dodge anything that got asked him because the people asking the questions didn't know a dang thing. I'll have to get, about I'll have what to have my staff get back about. to you on that, Mike. Uh, and, and that's the thing here is we're dealing with a group of governing officials and this is, I'm not talking about any party in particular. I'm talking about every person that asked a question. No clue. Just no clue of the ramifications of this, the implications of this, the technology behind it. The users that use the service, any aspect of this business, they're just completely out in left field about these questions. And they missed a gigantic opportunity to deal with the situation and get to the bottom of the problem without having endless debates in the Senate about it. There this were, was un- the- and, and this was really unfortunate for me listening in, was that there were some good questions and some gems of responses from Zuckerberg that were not followed up on. Mm-hmm. For example... Zuckerberg admitted that there are such things as shadow profiles. He doesn't call them that, but they exist. The idea that people who are not on Facebook, Facebook has profiles on people who are not act on Facebook, who do not have Facebook accounts, and that, that Facebook says you can opt out of that data collection, but whenever you do, Facebook directs you to sign up for a Facebook account in order to opt out. Yeah. And that was raised in, in these hearings and not followed up upon. Yeah, there's a lot here that that there's the first day in particular, Zuckerberg would toss them a softball and they would just watch it land on the ground next to them, which is infuriating. Not because I'm a big adversary of Facebook. I think it has its uses and I think it has its needs. It's just this is an issue. The use of people's data that you give willingly or is gathered from other people and you did not give willingly. This is a big issue of our time. It will continue to be an issue of our time. 
So why they decided that this, they were just going to deal with lobbyist questions or questions their kids wanted answered or anything like that. I have no idea. You know what? Get on the phone and find someone who knows more than you do about this. Well, they weren't really prepared well to follow up once they had an answer is I think the part of the problem. And that goes back to finding somebody that does know these questions. That goes back to getting the same amount of preparation for the question and answer session that Zuckerberg was given. Fair. I'll have to have my staff get back to you on that. Hmm. And my staff will get back to your staff, and maybe between the two of them, they'll know something about the topic. Well, <clears throat> let's see. If if your staff get back to my staff, and my staff get back to your staff, but only after a lobbyist lunch. Well, that lobbyist lunch is important. And I say this in the shadow of the Washington Monument. So th- this kind of thing is omnipresent, whether whether I want it to be or not. And it's happening right under my nose. And it's infuriating. The, the whole process is infuriating and has been for decades. So It's happening right under your nose, Mike. What are you doing podcasting? Go out and solve it. Get out there. Well, that's what I'm trying to do by the podcast. No. Maybe one of them will get fed the podcast. They get called idiots by Mike Worthley <sighs> in Virginia, and they'll get a point. There's just, I mean, they can't, even, but between them all, they couldn't buy a clue. Right. So on that note, here's our public advocacy. Um, I think that there is there are several good applications on the App Store for doing this. One of them is... And I'm blanking on the exact name, but it's something like five calls. And the premise is that you use the application and it locates your representatives. And all you have to do is leave five calls, five messages for them. And if you do that regularly, then you will move the needle. And if all of us do it, then it's a movement. And if all of us do it, then we all move the needle. And that, my friends, that's democracy at work. I would like every Apple Insider reader and listener that votes, and I would hope it would be all of you, to look at the candidate you like and see if they know anything about the future of technology at all. And that's not just an American issue for that matter. That that generally goes for wherever you may live and have representative government. So just... It's not just if you're going to get what you need. If if they cannot make intelligent decisions about our future, they shouldn't be in office. That's it. Spectacularly, I got the name of the application correct. There is an application on the App Store called Five Calls, <laughs> and it has different uh, – they have an extended list of policy topics to tall, call on. They have some copy that you can use if you want to. But the the real utility here is that it will help you dial your – especially if you're in America, it will help you dial your representatives – and be able to leave messages for them. And one of the cool things that I understand is that you don't have to call during business hours and actually hope to speak to someone. If you are nervous about speaking on the phone or or simply don't like doing that, make the calls after hours, leave the messages on their voicemail box, and they will still have to be counted as calls in support or against of an issue. One second. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. Sorry about that. So that link will be in the show notes. Thank you very much. Um, two, two last things that we'll talk about here as we round out this episode, Mike. So Andrew O'Hara published a feature on nine CarPlay features that he wished for, for iOS 12. Mm -hmm. And I, I was actually surprised to see that two of my top one, my, my, my top two on my list didn't make his list at all. What are your top two? Okay. My top two are, first of all, I want a battery indicator on the status bar for CarPlay. Mm Mm-hmm. You get that in wireless CarPlay, but very, as Andrew notes, very few people have wireless CarPlay. And the reason is that when I plug into the car and I'm driving somewhere, I would like to know that when I arrive, I will have full battery. Or if I don't, I'd like to know just how bad off I am. And having that battery indicator on the dashboard would be convenient. It's not there, but frustratingly, it is if you're using wireless CarPlay. So we know that they know how to do it. They just don't give it to everyone. They just assume that you're going to have power since you're tethered. I think that's a bad assumption. Well, I, I believe you're correct. I just <laughs> that just seems to be the yeah. The, you're, you're right. The, that's the their, their presumption. The it's I think mm-hmm. a bad one. Um, the other feature that I'd like is we know that when you're doing navigation, they give you the speed limit of the road that you're on. Why can't they give me my actual speed? You know, if you're using Waze, for example, Waze gives you your speed and will change the speed limit sign to red if you happen to be going over the speed limit. I wonder if this has got something to do with the relative finickiness of location detection. I wonder if this is a conscious decision that Apple made, because obviously they could implement it, because they have something very similar to it in Do Not Disturb When Driving, right? Right. So years and years ago, there was a court case where a kid driving a rental car 
was ticketed for going well over the speed limit. And the rental car had sold him the GPS in-car unit. And so they subpoenaed that information and found that given the the distance that he'd gone and the speeds recorded by the GPS unit, there was absolutely no way that he could have gone fast enough to, to break the speed limit, as they'd said he had. But it didn't matter because the GPS data wasn't admissible in the court for whatever reason. Hmm. And so my my one guess is that Apple declines to put that information on the screen on the basis that they don't want to be the subject of a, a case where someone was speeding and they say, but my car play showed that I was going this speed. They they don't want to be a part of that. You know, if, yeah, that follows. Yeah, but it's incredibly useful. It really is. the The in car speedometers in most cars are actually not accurate, and part of that is the way that they're driven. Whether they're driven electronically off of a sensor, off the transmission, or by a cable, um, they tend to be accurate for some part of the range, but they're not accurate across the whole range. And so, I know, for example, that if I'm trying to drive 55 miles an hour, that I am going five miles slower than the dial actually says. Okay. So having that information on the dashboard would only help me be more accurate rather than less. That's why I wish for that. So yeah, I'm th- this is a great article and I looked at the things that Andrew wanted to see in 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 CarPlay. And as I'd mentioned before, I I have used CarPlay, but given that my life and my work centers around technology, that's kind of my bastion of very little technology. So I will sit there and I will drive and I will, I've been living here long enough. I can get just about anywhere. So at this point, don't worry about it. Now, should I move? That's going to change radically Mm. because then I will definitely need something like this. And I will definitely need the navigation aids because unfolding a car, unfolding a map in a car, that's so 2000. That's so 1995. I I, I don't think I could get myself to do that. Yeah. Well, and it's not just navigation. We should point out that CarPlay is also the in-car entertainment in terms of your music. It's Mm -hmm. also your hands-free for messages and calls. Yep. It's there, there's a lot there besides just navigation. Now, one of Andrew's requests was support for third-party map applications. And that's interesting because Google and Waze both have the reputation of being more accurate and being better at rerouting for time. Of mm-hmm. course, what we found from that article that we talked about a couple episodes back was that Apple is actually the best at getting you on time because they overpromise. Right. They they get you there a few minutes early so that you can park and have time to do things where Google is the most accurate being spot on the number. And and Waze makes you feel, Waze is sort of a panacea. It makes you feel that you're doing something by taking these crazy routes through neighborhoods, but in fact have not <laughs> actually done anything to help your case. As long as you keep moving, you're all good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see, what else did he want? He wanted, so when you're driving with the navigation open, with Apple Maps open on CarPlay, the main screen on the dashboard shows the maps display, and the secondary spleen, screen, that's your iPhone display, shows the list of step-by-step operations. Right. And he's, his hope is that more applications could do that. Now, he points at Apple for saying that Apple should make that happen. The truth of the matter is that that's not Apple's bet at all. That's up to the app developer to do something. And a good example of that is um, Overcast, the podcasting application, mm-hmm. podcast receiving application. So on the dashboard display, <coughs> forgive me, <coughs> forgive me, on the dashboard display, they have the normal audio kind of player, the select the podcasts and select the play pause controls the same way as any other audio application. And on the phone, they actually keep the Overcast applica- interface open that looks much like it does when you're connected or not connected. So it's it's up to each app developer to do that. It's not something that's on Apple's side to fix. Yeah, I, it's – who knows exactly how far along this is? I mean, is it the – again, this is one of those range things that we may, may never really know. Does Apple make it easy to do this? I don't know. So is it 80% on developer, 20% on Apple? Is it the other way around? Is it half split? Here's eh. Here's the real problem. The real problem is that – Apple has not done much to convince or encourage people to make CarPlay applications. Where yeah, everything else, yeah. uh, let, me, let me let me explain that a little bit. Where everything else, they have the SDK, they have the developers kit, they lay mm-hmm. it all out, and they want you to submit to the App Store, and that's it. If you want to write a CarPlay application, you have to go to a special web page on Apple's site and fill in why you think you should be allowed to make a CarPlay application, and then they decide whether or not you're good enough to do it. 
Well, as much as I like Alto's Odyssey, I don't think I want it on my dashboard. Well, no, and and that's fine that they want to filter that, but it's a definitely an added layer of complication, and mm. it's it's simply just not as pushed as any of the other things. You know, they would love for people to write Apple TV applications. The CarPlay a little less so. Okay. Yeah, I mean that that sounds like the biggest the biggest barrier to entry out of any of this stuff. So you know you you have to justify why your application should be on the car, and I, I agree. Alto's Odyssey makes a little less sense. <laughs> you know, Dark Sky or Carrot Weather or one of these may make more sense. Could um, you know just as you don't want your your flight tracker, you don't need to see the planes going overhead necessarily on your dashboard display. There, there's a yeah, context. A weird one. Well, mm. I'm just throwing stuff out there, right? Yeah. You know, the things that exist for Apple Watch don't necessarily belong on the CarPlay display. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's a that's another interesting point. So we have all of these operating systems under a common core, and you can build the apps for them all in Xcode, right? Mm. You've got your tiny little Apple Watch screen. You've got a variety of iPhone screens. You have a couple of different iPad screens. You've got the Mac with an infinite number of sizes of screens and combinations. You, and so now we're adding CarPlay into that. And it, there's just, there's a lot going on there. And in the, in the name of simplicity, Apple keeps control of some of the aspects of this, like most notably on the Apple Watch and on CarPlay. And it, is that good or bad for the user? I, I argue that it's good in the interest of computing as an appliance. And for simplicity's sake, more than anything else, I would suppose. Right. Now, should they open it up and allow Waze and Google Maps to participate in there? And, and Nokia here, for that matter? Uh yeah, probably. That'd be good. But is is it something that they could make more approachable for developers? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's absolutely something they can make more approachable for developers. And they probably should at some point. Yeah. Now, I, after this call and after we edit this, am going to install the ILX009, which is Alpine's latest CarPlay unit. We talked about it back at CES at the beginning of the year, and I have one. And so I have to rip open my dashboard and install this thing. It's a nine-inch CarPlay display. The doubled in or single? Well, it's interesting. It's singled in for the unit itself, and then there's a little tiny ribbon cable from the front of that singled-in unit that connects to the back of this nine-inch glorious display that then mounts on that singled-in <laughs> unit. And and so one of the things that I hope to find out, I, th I believe the way it works is that the clips are, are movable. And so you can, you can mount it high or mount it low, depending on where your vents are or your heater controls or whatever you may have. So it fits in the single in space, and then you can adjust where the nine inch display actually lives on top of it. That'd be good. It's going to be pretty sweet. That's yeah, what it's I know gonna like be. for instance, in, in my car, my stereo is, it's a double din unit, but it's low. It's relatively low on my dashboard. Right. So, so in your case, you'd want to mount the the clips at the bottom of the nine inch display so that most of it is mm -hmm. aiming up, right? Does make sense, right? And for me, if I did that, um, I would be covering my center stack air vents, and so I would need to do it a little bit more centered or a little bit more at the top edge of the display so that the display is yeah. hanging down. I can see where that would be a problem. Well, knowing Alpine, they've probably taken this into account, wouldn't you say? I would hope so. Uh, but again, it's one of those things I'm not sure that they can conceivably account for every possible configuration. It'd be interesting to see what your feedback is on that. Well, I think the deal here for me is that if you've got a double DIN unit, that you're probably in good shape, even though this is a single DIN unit, um, because the double DIN center stacks tend to be a little bit more flexible for this kind of thing. If you've got a single unit and you've got heater controls jammed below it and and something else jammed above it, that you're more likely going to obscure something. But even so, there there's still a lot of flexibility here, I believe. Yeah, I was trying to do the math if I could even get a nine inch screen in in my car. I'm not certain that I can, but uh, we'll be looking forward to your report on it. Fantastic. Well, would you like to talk HomeKit for just one moment? Sure. Let's round this out with HomeKit. So Andrew O'Hara gentleman that he is, scholar that he is, wrote about how to fix HomeKit camera's biggest flaws and gain some privacy. So this is the thing, right? When you start placing cameras inside your home, this becomes a concern for people who are inside the home and don't really feel comfortable about being watched all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I have a camera inside the house, and I've, I've tend to aim it pretty obliquely so that it's not really videoing anyone specific. It's just capturing motion or sound in the house. Mm -hmm. um, the greater utility I found for me personally was placing cameras outside the house or on the doorbell, for example. And 
we've reviewed the D-Link Omna and the Logitech Circle too, the, the other HomeKit cameras that have been coming to market. And we also did a piece on Raspberry Pi as a HomeKit camera. Mm-hmm. And the, the two big issues that owners face, Andrew says, are lack of recording options and the ability to create a privacy mode so that you can reassure people that they're not necessarily being watched all the time. So manufacturer's apps can help you handle the recordings, right? Whether it's a micro SD card that's inside or offline storage or a monthly plan for cloud storage, things like that. That's kind of sorted out. But in terms of privacy mode, there's no fantastic solution. So what Andrew's proposing is, is that Currently, anyone who you've given access to the home app has the capability to open the app and view a live stream at any time. And depending on where you've placed cameras within your house, you may not like this. Um, so what he's proposing is that you use a HomeKit outlet switch like the iDevices switch or the Piragur switch or the the Belkin switch or the iHome switch or any oh, one of these outlet one, switches. Yeah. Everyone made well, Kigu, key, key right? You, you reviewed the, uh, the Kigu ones, I think. Yep. Um, so you've got that plugged into the camera and that you set up in automation tabs a automation that is triggered by people arriving or people leaving. And what this automation will do is it will cut power to the camera when people are in the home so that the camera physically is powered off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it's, a, it's an ingenious solution. Obviously, it's not a $0 solution. Well, it's definitely not a $0 solution. And it's not entirely perfect because if the person who has access to the home app wanted to view the camera, why, they could just go ahead and turn that switch on manually and then view sure. the camera. So it's it's not yeah. a it's, it's not what we'd call a secure solution by any stretch of the imagination. But in terms of, of people's apathy and willing to go along with whatever's going on, if you open the camera and it's just not available because it's down, then you're likely to leave it alone. Mm-hmm. So for the most part, I'd say, you know, an 80% of the solution, this works most of the time, right? And the rest of the solution is not giving your home kit address out to people who you wouldn't want to have see you walk around in your house in a towel. There is that. There is that. Or maybe not walk around in the house in the towel, or maybe put the cameras on the floor that you don't walk around the house in a towel on. <laughs> <laughs> or that kind Any of thing, number yes. of different kinds of ways that we can think about our habits or change our habits. But, but uh, you know, when you start to put cameras around, people get edgy. And there's a reason why. It's, it's totally plausible to think of different kinds of things to account for here. Sure. And whether or not it makes sense to have them or what they're pointed at, for example. You know, it, I, like I said, I think it makes sense for me where I've pointed them not at the living areas, but at the doors. So yeah. the inside of the, the entranceway and the inside of the, the back door so that if someone were at the door or came through the door, I could see that. But I'm not going to see people in the, in the living areas necessarily. The, the larger point here that I took away from this is when you're building a home kit system, you kind of have to, you really, it's hard to do it ad hoc. It's hard to add a piece now and a piece later and a piece after that. You kind of have to think about the entire system, the sensitivities of who's coming in and using it. Like if it's just you controlling your stuff on your phone, Siri, no problem. But maybe the 85 year old senior doesn't want to deal with Siri and just wants a wall switch. Right. Well, a good point. So here's what I've thought about that for, for years. I have contended that the, the fancy Wi-Fi bulbs that people put in things are deadly stupid. Uh, I'm, and I'm not far behind you in that regard. There's there's definitely a hierarchy. The one thing that those do right is that when you turn on the light switch on the wall, they turn on. So mm-hmm. they they follow the cardinal rule for me, which is behave as if it were not a smart product. Yep. What I've done differently, and and what you've you've done maybe is have you put the uh, the kooky switches in the walls and the light switches? I have a couple different. I haven't really talked about it yet, but I I've been running I've been running well experiments on my family. Hmm. With smart bulbs and smart switches scattered about the house, yes. Right. So in in the wall, light switches that are smart, yep. yeah? Yep. Okay. What I've done is I've taken the uh, SwitchMate ones, which are magnetically attached Bluetooth ones. Yeah, you had mentioned that, the ones that toggle the switch. Yeah, they, they just run a motor that toggles the switch. Mm-hmm. And put those on the HomeKit network using HomeBridge. And they work exactly as you'd expect. I think putting things on the wall switch works way better than changing the bulb because then things behave exactly as you expect they would. And the only problem when you do something in wall is if there's a problem with the software and the thing gets stuck, do you know what it means to reboot your in-wall wall wall switch? Um, I haven't run into it just yet, but go ahead. Oh, but the day you do, you'll know. (laughs) 
<laughs> it means going out to the breaker box and flipping the breaker so that you can reboot the in, the hardwired wall switch. Yeah, that's just annoy my family. It won't annoy me, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so tip to people who are not me. Um, make sure that your breaker box is accessible and that people in the family know where it is. True enough. That, that, yeah, with any kind of smart home <laughs> accessory, that's just a, that's a good idea yeah. anyway. And that's why I'm happy that I've gone with these battery powered Bluetooth ones that they can just magnetically pop off and use without them. So there you go. That's that. Well, that brings us to the end of episode 168 of the Apple Insider podcast. I'm Victor Marks, and, and joining me has been Instagram sensation Mike Worthley. Well, you see, now I actually have to join. No, you don't. It's your fault. I, I, have to join you. I make no requirement that you join Instagram, <laughs> which is a property of Facebook, I should mention. So, so no, there's no requirement for you to be an Instagram sensation, Mike. Good. So don't look for Mike Worthley on Instagram because it won't be me. Instead, follow Apple Insider. That's uh, Apple Insider underscore official and mine at VMarksy, V-M-A-R-K-S-I. And uh, I'm VMarks on Twitter. You're Mike Worthley on Twitter. Yes, I am. And it's better to follow the link than try and type it in. Heavens, yes. We will be back next week with more. Thank you so much. And so long, everybody. Thank you for leaving positive reviews on iTunes. We really appreciate them. They are so helpful. And I want to thank you, each and every one of you, for listening. Please have a wonderful day.